<laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Encore. And I met Encore for about five minutes, about a month ago, and he said, will you come speak to this group? And I said, of course, I love speaking to students. And I met Mike for about 20 seconds out in the hall, but I'm actually gonna say many of the same things Mike did. So it's kind of, but I'm gonna tell the story very differently, but I think you'll see that we kind of end up in the same place. So that's a pleasant coincidence, <laughs> since we didn't know each other, and I didn't know what you were gonna say. And I'm, I've already learned a lot. Um, I, I had to remind Encore that I'm, I'm not a climate change expert at all, even though I'm an environmental engineer and an environmental scientist. Uh, most of my work has been in the hazardous waste world. So we're gonna kind of end up in the same place because I'm gonna take you through pollution, what that has to do with climate change, what it has to do with global instability and global insecurity. So we're gonna take a really big view. Um, now I know you live in Huntsville, so you may recognize my last name. My brother and I are here, my brother Peter and I are here um, in part to help the Rocket Center celebrate the summer's 50th anniversary of the moon landing. So we're pretty excited about that. So since, I'm, since I did spend a long time in academia, we have to start with a quiz. What's that a picture of? Saturn V. Saturn V, and you got two of them across the street from you, so you have quite a view. Um, and the Saturn V, and of course going to the moon, uh, in 1968 with Apollo 8 and later with Apollo 11 when we landed on the moon led to this incredibly famous picture of Earthrise. And I think um, it is no coincidence that this photograph, about 16 months later, we celebrated the first Earth Day, the first celebration of our own planet. Because this was the picture that made us realize what a beautiful, fragile place this is lest we forget. And I think in many ways the earth rise has led to this sunrise movement that you're celebrating here tonight. Here's a picture of earth from Mars. You can barely see it, it's a little, can we kill the front light, row of lights, do you know? Um, and the, the horizon here that you see barely at the bottom is, is the surface of Mars. And um, you know, earth's just, bare, you can barely see it. That's better. Yeah, let's leave it about there. Yeah, so there's Earth, far away. You know, we can only directly observe about 4% of the entire universe. And we have found about 4,000 planets, but so far we don't think we found anything quite as livable as Earth. Um, our father really worked on getting from the Earth to the moon. My mission has been much, uh, less glorious because I've spent most of my time looking at hazardous waste sites on planet Earth. And I've traveled, and the story I'm gonna tell you about tonight is, is a journey that I've taken from Idaho, where I live, to Nigeria. And how that has to do with climate change, I hope all comes together by the end of this. Um, as Ankur mentioned, my husband and I had an environmental engineering firm for about 30 years and we worked a lot on mining issues in the United States. We worked on a lot of environmental justice cases where mining basically took advantage of poor communities and polluted places. And we spent most of our career, I guess you could say, fighting big industry. Um, a lot of environmental cases are pretty, you know, you're kind of on one side or the other. And we were always on the side of communities and governments and often fighting industry. Now, that's not to say that all industry is bad. They're not but it's always the small percentage of the really bad guys that make most of the problems. And that's true, I think, in most industries. Um, so I, you know, when I say we fought industry, it was a small percentage of, of bad actors in an otherwise um, you know, corporate world that had a lot of good players. I also spent uh, 31 years at the University of Idaho, and again, that was mostly tied in with environmental engineering and environmental science. When we retired, so-called retirement, um, we started this foundation because we had been doing a lot of work in the US. We started doing more and more work internationally. And when we retired, we, we really kind of couldn't give up that passion for working on international environmental issues. So we started this nonprofit working primarily with community level projects where people's health is affected 
by pollution, a lot of it mining pollution. So sort of taking that model that we developed in the U.S. for working with communities and cleaning up environmental pollution in the U.S. model, which is often, you know, we spend a lot of money on stuff. You take that overseas and you have to kind of change it because the sources of funds that we have to do environmental cleanup in the U.S. don't always exist overseas. And as Mike mentioned, you know, part of the environmental movement, my first job was with EPA. And when EPA passed laws to clean the water and clean the air and clean the soil, kind of in that order, um, a lot of industries, a lot of polluting big manufacturing industries have moved overseas. So we have very few, for example, primary smelters of basic metals in the U.S. anymore. Those operations have gone overseas. Not only has the CO2 production gone overseas, but the pollution has gone overseas. And that's why we, with our foundation, are still sort of chasing that pollution. So my journey has really involved um, projects, as Ankur mentioned, we have projects in Bangladesh, in Kyrgyzstan, we've worked on a project in Zambia. This picture in the center here, these three boys are going fishing in a little creek that is downstream from an abandoned smelter. And so that picture kind of summarizes what I'm trying to stop from happening. Um, that's me in Nigeria sampling the interior of a household. I'm holding a little thing that looks like a ray gun from Star Trek. It's called an X-ray fluorescent, fluorescent detector, an XRF, and it measures uh, metals pollution, metals levels in surfaces. That picture also reminds me that I have flunked retirement. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, it's led us to some really incredible adventures and the work that we've been doing, this is a picture of my husband and, and myself in Nigeria, has really been the best work we've done. So sort of contrary to normal people's life's path, you know, you think when you retire, oh, now I'm gonna go play. Well, we are still playing, but it's in waste ups. So travel over to Nigeria. Has anybody been to Nigeria? Where? I've been to Sokoto. It's on the map. Uh, I think it's on the map. Yeah, yeah. Sokoto is an amazing historical place. Usually when I ask that question, everybody looks at me like, oh, I haven't been there. So besides you, what do you know about Nigeria? What comes to mind when somebody mentions Nigeria? Sorry? Oil and tyranny. Oil and tyranny. A lot of oil in the south. Tyranny kind of especially between the North and the South, and in the North. What else? Spam email. Spam email from the uncle who wants your account number because he wants to send you lots of money? Yep. What else? Sorry? Poverty. Poverty, especially in the North. Nigeria is very divided right across the middle. The North is generally poorer. It's Muslim. The South is generally richer and Christian. Abuja, the capital right in the middle there, an artificial capital that was sort of created to say, let's try to bring these two artificial halves of a country that the, the British, when they left the colony, they did one of those arbitrary circles and said, here's a country. And it has lots of conflicts. So where we've been working is in the North, near Sokoto, the yellow area. Um, called Zamfara, which is a state in Nigeria. And Nigeria has, you know, most of the things that people know about it are kind of negative connotations, you know, like scams and violence and the, the kidnapping of the Chibok schoolgirls a few years ago. You know, it has kind of a negative connotation. And I didn't know much about it when I first went there, but I first went there in 2010, so almost 10 years ago. Um, and I have since really come to love it. It's a, it's a beautiful, fascinating country. It is the most populous country in Africa. It has 174 million people. It has a very young population. The majority of those people are under 30. Um, and the project that we worked on there is, is part of the story that I'm going to tell you kind of briefly because it's a heartbreaking story. We went there because 
Zamfara, the state in Nigeria, had what is probably the worst case of lead poisoning in modern history. In April of 2010, Doctors Without Borders, who were sort of like the emergency room doctors of the world, they treat people in poor places that don't have access to medical care, um, contacted us to help them figure out why all of these children were dying. Now, Doctors Without Borders typically does things like meningitis and cholera and infectious disease, but they realized that the epidemic of deaths in these communities were something different. And <clears throat> within six months, probably 500 children died. We don't even, we'll probably never know the exact number. In some villages, 30 to 43 percent of all children under age five died in a very short period of time. And there were probably 17,000 villagers who have been pretty seriously lead poisoned. So Doctors Without Borders, MSF, sent some blood to Germany in trying to figure out what was causing this. And it turned out that these children were lead poisoned. And MSF doesn't really do lead poisoning. You know, they do infectious disease. And we've done a lot of work in lead poisoning. So they contacted us and said, you know, well, now what do we do? Um, one of the problems with lead poisoning is you can medically treat children with drugs that are chelation drugs, which basically eliminate the lead from your body. It takes a while. It's pretty hard on you. But if you send that child back to a contaminated environment, they get even sicker because their body then is looking for metals and sucks it up even more like a magnet. So you have to clean the environment before you can medically treat the children. Well, with these kind of death rates, you can imagine that cleaning the environment was a super high priority. It, it became, um, you know, a, really a race against time. Well, how did this happen? The first thing that happened was the price of gold skyrocketed in about 2010. And we, have, we know historically, every time the price of metals goes up, people do more and more desperate things to be part of that economy. And in this place, people were farming, making maybe three bucks a day. The price of gold went so high that they could turn to mining and make maybe eight bucks a day. So they could you know, double or triple their income. That was combined with the terrible disaster that the gold that they were mining was in colonial lead mines. When we first figured this out, all of the geologists said, that's impossible. In fact, some of them still say that. They say there is not enough gold in lead for that to be profitable. Well, if you're really poor and the price of gold is really high, it can be profitable. And <clears throat> so they were actually crushing lead ore to recover the gold. The fact that there was enough gold in this ore was a geologic pretty unusual phenomenon, but that was the case there, so it was part of this perfect storm. And the last part of it was, in this part of Nigeria, people are living and conducting really primitive mining practices. I'll show you a few pictures so you'll get an idea. And the women in these communities um, are ruled by Purta. This is a Sharia law state, so the women of childbearing age never leave their household compounds. And the women wanted to be part of this economy. And so they were actually crushing this lead ore in their kitchens with their kids right there. And that was what led to this massive lead poisoning. This will come back to climate change, believe me. <laughs> so what our job is in a project like this is to really figure out where are the pathways of risk and exposure. So we're interviewing families. We're looking at where they're grinding the ore in their food containers, which contaminated the food supply pretty drastically. Some of the bricks that houses were made out of were also made of contaminated material. And then in the upper corner there, we're also interviewing, taking notes, taking samples, taking thousands and thousands of samples to try to figure out how big this problem is and how we're going to fix it. So you try to identify all the pathways of exposure Food, dust, children working in mining camps. Is the water supply safe? What about those bricks? What about that food supply? And the way children are lead poisoned is not through respiration primarily, it's through ingestion. Basically, kids eat dirt. If you've ever been around a two-year-old, you know this is what they're doing all day long. Every, they're exploring the world through their mouth. Everything that falls on the ground, whether it's a toy, or anything, it goes right into their mouth. And this happens 
with kids in Nigeria, it happens with kids living in Sun Valley, Idaho, rich, poor, doesn't matter, kids eat dirt. And people have studied that in the US, kids eat close to 100 milligrams of soil a day if they're about two years old. So people have actually studied that. We figured, and we don't know, but we figure kids in this environment are probably consuming a lot more soil than that. And if that soil is contaminated then, that's how they're getting lead poisoned. So these children are living in houses with mostly dirt floors. They don't have a lot of running water. So hygiene becomes part of that, um, that issue. And what our job then is, once we've identified the exposure pathways, to break those, to say, how do we get rid of those pathways of exposure? We literally remove the dirty dirt. We remove the contaminated dirt physically. We bury it in landfills. We bring back clean dirt, uncontaminated soil for the exposure then that the children, they're still consuming soil, but now it's not contaminated soil. And we hired about 400 local villagers to do this. Um, local folks made the uniforms of choice, white t-shirts and purple pants. So those were the, the, uh, the uniforms. And that was important because they had to clean their clothes. They set it up so that they cleaned their clothes every night so that the workers were not bringing contaminated soil on their, um, on their clothes back into the compound. So we're literally scraping off the contaminated soil. We're using that XRF to measure, is there still contamination? If so, keep scraping till we get to a clean layer because this all came from the surface. And then we bring back clean soil and we're using uh, local agricultural tools. So we wanted to make sure that not only were we hiring local workers, but they, they were using equipment that they had access to. So a lot of this is training people how to sustain and maintain the remedy. And fortunately, blood lead levels dropped. So lead is measured in the blood. And it was extremely high at the beginning of the project. In fact, probably some of the highest blood lead levels people have ever measured in living children. Uh, but it dropped pretty drastically to the point where they could begin chelation treatment. So we were doing the environmental remediation. Doctors Without Borders is doing the medical treatment. And it's still not down to what we would consider acceptable levels in the United States. And it's going to take a long time to get there. When I was a child in Huntsville in the 50s, I'm guessing my blood lead level was probably about 30. Why do you think that was? Pipes. Not lead pipes, although that can be a source. Sorry? Lead paint can be an issue, but nope. Lead and gasoline. We took lead out of gasoline in this country in the 70s. So everybody that was born before, I'm presuming Mike and I, we lost, blood, blood, we lost brain cells because of leaded gasoline. We'd be so much smarter if it hadn't been for that. Those of you born after leaded gasoline was taken out, you know, your blood lead levels as children were probably in the tens or something. The US average is about two. Our standard in the US used to be 40 because nobody was really much under that level for a long time. But anyway, we're getting there, but it's going to take a while because these levels started out so extremely high. But we considered this you know, a great success because the environmental exposure was reduced enough that they could begin the medical treatment to save those kids. And as I mentioned, we've trained about 400,000 local villagers. We've also worked with the the local emirate who played a big role as the religious leader, which really has more clout than a lot of the other government forms there in ensuring the participation of the community. We worked with the local health department, with the state and federal health department and environmental departments. So that's kind of a real snapshot of a project that we've been working on for 10 years. What does that have to do with anything we're talking about tonight? Well, this informal sector these people are just mining on their own. They don't work for a big company. They're just digging in the dirt, digging in these old lead mines and recovering product and selling it to somebody. Well, it turns out that around the world, about 15 to 20% of minerals and metals come from artisanal, small scale mining. So this is actually a pretty big source of metals in the global economy. 
as you can see, about 20% of gold, tin, some other things are coming from artisanal miners, people who are just literally digging in the dirt, working for themselves. So that's sort of the product piece of this. What about the people piece of this? How many people are involved? We don't really know. In 2008, the World Bank guessed there were 20 million people on this planet doing this kind of work. Not all just gold and lead, but other metals. But all, all of them pretty dangerous for one reason or another. By 2013, twice that many. By 2019, they're still guessing maybe 40 million. But as you can imagine, these are you know, pretty wild guesses because most of these people are working in really isolated places. Some of them are doing it illegally in their governments or they're doing it at night. But it's estimated that 100 million people because of the families these miners are supporting, and often they're women and children working in these operations, 100 million people supported by artisanal mining. In industrial mining, people who are working for mining companies who have salaries, health care, maybe occupational safety, 7 million, so a lot less. So it's not really very small scale. And they're doing this on a subsistence level, far from any health care, often. There are also physical dangers in addition to all the contaminants. They're not working in an industrial area. They're often working in their kitchens. And as I mentioned, women and kids are involved. So this is another perfect storm on a much bigger scale. What happens is there's resources being extracted. Whenever, I said, whenever metals prices go up, people are doing more desperate things. They're often turning from farming to mining, for example. That leads to all kinds of conflicts, maybe at a very local tribal level, maybe within a country, maybe across countries. Climate change drives a lot of that. And on the human level, it ends up creating tremendous environmental health challenges, which is kind of the area that we work in. So let's look at this in some simpler picture scales. So here's the conflicts between farmers and miners. And this is very much the story in Nigeria. So tribal herdsmen and farmers had traditional uses of land, which climate change was starting to make less and less feasible, running out of water. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa, I mean, that is the story in a nutshell. So people then turn to mining as another source of subsistence. I love this graphic so much that I paid the artist royalties to be able to use it because I love to use it. Because I think this sort of sums it all up. Um, rich countries benefiting from extraction of resources from poor countries. And it's often literally, if you look at the numbers, it's us in Europe extracting resources, especially from Africa, also from Latin America, South America. But that kind of sums it up, and it's very much driven by the, the P part of the price. Here's the price of gold from 1974 till now. That peak you see in 2010 is when the lead poisoning epidemic happened in Zemfar. And we actually know, I mean, there was a case in Idaho that we worked on in the, in the late 70s and 80s, which was related to the first peak, because the industry in that case decided to run full bore, burned up their air pollution control equipment, and poisoned a bunch of kids in Idaho. So this graph is sort of like my work history, those two big peaks. And metals prices, even though they've dipped a little bit, they are continuing to go up. And this is true for gold, but it's true for a lot of other precious metals things that we're using in our cell phones and so forth. So on that big picture, who's responsible for this? Whose fault is it, if you want to look at it that way? It's us. We buy the products. Who else? Manufacturers? Supply chains? Governments? It's the whole list. So you've pretty much named them all. Um, and it, it, it can be pretty overwhelming, as Mike mentioned. You know, sometimes when you look at these things, you just go, ah, I'm just going to go jump off a cliff. It's hopeless. 
But I'm actually a very optimistic person, and most of us in this room represent that last bullet big time as consumers. And consumers, I think especially for the generation that's primarily represented in this room, I think you have a bigger impact than any generation has ever had. Because in my generation, you know, we could say, and I'm embarrassed to have brought, you know, a plastic water bottle into this class, but I did. You know, I could say, um, well, gee, I don't know what went into producing this. You know, was it slave labor? Was it, I don't know, or my tennis shoes? You know, we, we literally didn't know a lot of stuff. Nowadays, it's not too hard to figure out what is behind a product that we buy. How was it manufactured? What were the labor considerations? What were the environmental considerations? And I'm greatly optimistic that that is going to play a bigger and bigger role in consumer demand for how products are manufactured and how the people behind those products are treated. Consumers also vote. So Mike mentioned all the political demographics of this issue. That is a huge piece of power. In Nigeria, I also learned about the power of the media. And, you know, we live in a waterfall of information from the media every day, but working, in, working and living in a country that has a free press is so incredibly important. Nigeria had a, has a pretty free press, and we actually benefited a lot from media stories that made the government officials say, we literally had a meeting one day where a government official said, how can we stop all this bad press about the lead poisonings? And one of my colleagues said, you could do something about the problem. And literally, it was like a little light bulb went on. And they, the government started to take action. And then we were feeding stories to the press about what a great job the government was doing in addressing this problem. You know, it's like praise and glory for the non-participants at the last minute. But that's just as important. Because then they realized, hey, you know, if we do something good, they'll write good things about us, and we might actually get reelected. Works that way all over the world. This is my last picture, because I am from Idaho, and I have to show you a beautiful picture from Lake Stanley in the middle of Idaho. And this is a picture of the dark sky, and I'm real proud because this part of Idaho is the first dark sky reserve in the country, which means that the communities there have gotten, and it actually includes Sun Valley, which is sort of our rich, weird part of Idaho, which none of us that live there actually relate to. But they have a lot of money, and they, but this is also other communities in Idaho who said, we're gonna take all of the light that beams up into the sky and is wasted, we're gonna shield it so that it's pointing down to the ground where we want it to preserve the dark sky. And I wanna end on this picture because I wanna read you the statistic. In the United States, 80% of people live in cities where light pollution obscures their view of the stars, 80%. One third of people on planet Earth cannot see the Milky Way. Now to me, that says a lot about not just light pollution, but all the pollution that's part of the greenhouse gases that we're contributing. But it also says something about hope. The kids in Nigeria can see the night sky. And that gives me kind of like, well, OK, at least if you can see the sky and you can imagine something bigger than yourself, it's something that gives you hope. But a third of the planet can't see the night sky. I traveled with a young woman from China for a month once, and she said, have you ever seen stars? I thought, God, I, you know, I grew up in Huntsville, Alabama. Yeah, I've seen stars. She had never seen stars. She lived in Beijing her whole life and has never seen stars. So on that note, we can overcome impossible odds, as Mike said. We can. I mean, we have landed on the moon. We can solve these problems. But it takes a lot of political will. It takes a lot of grassroots effort. It takes a lot of town hall, town hall meetings. And so again, I commend you for being here and thank you.